welcome to Reality Tea Times 2, the podcast where we discuss all the trash reality TV we love to hate. I'm Janika, and today we are going to be discussing 90 Day Fiance. We're back. So, before we do, we are just going to do some hot goss. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is Maria from The Bachelor. Apparently, it's kind of come to the attention of people that Maria actually starred in a movie. And a pretty popular movie at that. Maybe one called The Pacifier that came out in 2005 with Vin Diesel. Whoa. She apparently played a firefly. I don't remember much of much. So maybe it was just like an extra kind of situation. But she apparently did a throwback Thursday um, of this. And she captioned um, a picture of her from the movie on Instagram. She also. Uh, shared a photo of Diesel alongside her dad, Nick, uh, with the caption, Happy Father's Day to my dads. So, we'll also include Vin Diesel. So, yeah. So, that's pretty cool. Anyway, moving on right along from that, we are going to talk a little um, Love is Blind. And this is pertaining to this whole situation with Mainly Chelsea, Jessica, and Jimmy. So Jess kind of came out and had some words to say about how things were handled and how things went with her journey on Love is Blind with Jimmy and Chelsea. I would rather or not the two women ever really had a conversation with each other about what was going on. And Jessica kind of said, like, not you know, a conversation wasn't really necessary, didn't really necessarily happen. Um, she does say, like, I wish that Chelsea and I would have had the opportunity to have a conversation before she got engaged. But um, she kind of does say that she wishes that she could just tell her that. Um, she wishes that she would have been able to tell her um my over the moon love and excitement and support that I had for her. So it does again, this women kind of supporting each other. And she also did reveal kind of a behind the scenes secret of her time on set. This is just mainly Jessica. Um, telling E that the process was more draining than she expected because the filming days are so long. She says, it, I went into th- went to it thinking I'm going to have time to work out, but you're so emotionally invested and the dates are so, I was trying to say long, but she says like the conversations are, are you're having take so much out of you emotionally that when you have a little bit of downtime, you just want to chill and rest. So it's kind of a lot there. Moving on from that, we're going to go back to The Bachelor. And kind of talk about Lexi kind of came out after revealing her diagnosis of having stage five endometriosis and kind of her journey with that and kind of how that ties so closely in with The Bachelor. She mentioned that less than two weeks before meeting Joey, she had actually had egg retrieval surgery. She says, I needed at least a solid month after that to kind of recalibrate back to my normal body. Um, You know, she says it was hard. She says that um, she would have, like, with the previous diagnosis, she would have um, heavy bleeding and some issues with ovarian cysts while filming The Bachelor. So you can just imagine the just discomfort. If you're a woman listening to this, you're kind of understanding to some degree, but that's very uncomfortable. 
having to deal with that when you're not filming a television show. And then when you're also having to deal with ovarian cysts, like, that's a lot. She added, um, I said, I just turned 30. I froze my eggs. That is so empowering. I'm so proud of myself. If this guy doesn't want me when I'm a little puffy and a little emotionally coming down from hormones, then that's not someone that I want to marry. And I just decided to take a leap of faith and go on the show. Lexi continued with a message for viewers. Her watching the shows and critiquing people's appearances, which I don't even understand how fucking people are doing that. Like, it's fucking ridiculous. Nonetheless, she says, Just remember that you never know what this person is currently going through or has gone through. She's like, going through egg freezing, single at the age of 30 was the most empowering thing I've ever done for myself and my body in my entire life. When I look back, I would not change one thing. I now have the added security and confidence that I have eggs frozen at this very moment that will, I hope and pray, turn into embryos when I'm ready. Lexi added that it was hard going through the process by herself. She did recall a time when she walked into a fertility clinic and saw other women with their partners, and she realized that she was doing this alone. She's like, I never thought I'd be able to go through this alone, and knowing that I didn't just go through it alone, but I did it successfully, and then I went on The Bachelor, like, less than two weeks later, I can do anything. And damn, yes, you can. She says, I knew that if I could help even one woman out there suffering from endometriosis or infertility, it would make me feel like in some small way that my pain and suffering was worth it. Um, And this is all via her Instagram. So I'm sure if you want to take a look at it, you can probably find it. Um, And she said, I want to thank each and every one of you for the outpouring of messages and support that uh, she's received, which I think. I'm 100% in her corner. So she says she can, so she continued on by saying, I cannot even put into words how much it means to me to get the opportunity to share my story on this platform, but I am beyond grateful for the support of my family and friends, as well as the kindness and understanding shown to me by Joey, the producers and at Bachelor ABC for allowing endometriosis, an invisible illness to finally be seen. And I absolutely love that because she's right. Um, the, these, it, it's a hidden type thing because something you don't see in your day to day if you're just looking at somebody, but that person's going through something really painful, really sometimes debilitating. Sometimes other things are happening that you can't explain. Um, and, you know, I know from a different perspective that this is amazing to kind of have someone kind of put that out there. I love that this is becoming more of a thing that people are talking about, whether it's endometriosis, PCOS, or any other inf- uh, fertility type uh, diagnosis. It's it's amazing. So, congrats to everyone who's responsible for making sure this story was told. The only thing that I wish was told as well, which I don't know if it was, if she did tell him, if she just didn't want to tell him or what the case may have been, but I kind of wish the conversation of her going and getting her eggs retrieved was said, because I think that is so important to talk about. Not only if you are a person that's an, another half of a couple, or if you're a single person doing it on your own, I think that's such an important conversation to have as well. Um, And that, you know, it doesn't have to be this stigmatized thing or this thing we don't talk about or this thing that we just pretend doesn't happen. I think it needs to definitely be said. So, yeah, good on her. Um, Yeah. So, while we are on the Bachelor trope here, let's continue on to the next piece which is actually going to be talking about um, the whole situation between Jess and Maria in the fifth episode. 
Um, and whether or not she ever did apologize to Maria for her mm, attitude. And she does say, Jess says, which I would love to hear from Maria on this, but she does say that she did apologize to Maria, but just it wasn't aired on the show. Um, as we know, for those who don't know, maybe don't listen to it, this is pertaining to the fifth episode at the end where Maria went and got extra time with Joey after getting a rose just during the cocktail hour. Jess was kind of in her feelings about this because she hadn't had a lot of time with him. She wasn't sure if she was going to be sent home. And she took such offense to Maria taking extra time that it escalated and she ultimately called her a bitch. Um, uh, yeah. So it wasn't great. Ultimately, just to get her, did they get the rose um, as well? And, you know, it's just kind of like, you, you know, why? So, yeah, that's basically what happened. Um, so, in an Instagram story, just shared a photograph of herself and her fellow um, Bachelor contestants, including Maria, explaining that she did apologize for her actions. She wrote, in regards to Tuesday's episode, it was definitely a hard watch. I do not condone bullying, name calling, etc. And apologies were made immediately. I don't buy it. I don't think it was. I need to hear from Maria. If she has apologized, then fine. Did she apologize? But I just don't think it happened right away. I just don't think it does. It did because she's on the side with like Leah, Cindy, all of this, and I'm like, I don't think you did. But okay, anyway. <laughs> she says that it was immediate um and she explained that the women are watching the show back for the first time and it is very hard to see things not play out to their full extent that's the least of your concerns things are not playing out the way you thought they were just in general but just went on to say that her emotions took over on the night that she bullied Maria. She explained, in the moment, I was upset about losing time on multiple occasions due to trauma. Although it's no excuse, I, I let built up emotions and anger get the best of me, and I do regret that wholeheartedly. Um, she c concluded by asking viewers to please remember there are many conversations during and after filming that are only we are aware of we are more than just characters on your screen and we are humans with real emotions and feelings which again that's 100 percent true we are all well aware that there are things that are not being um aired but like that same energy needs to be applied to the shit that maria went through while being on the show from jess Leah, Sydney, those main people. And Jess is friends with Leah, was friends with Sydney, was friends with like whoever. And it's just like, okay, but clearly there were some things going on behind the scenes that we are not privy of, but there were a lot of things that were happening on screen in front of us in terms of bullying. And the fact that you say you don't condone the bullying, you're still friends with people who are bullying others. So there's also that. So, that's it for the hot goss. Let's head into just a couple of memes from the 90 Day official Twitter account. Kind of more of that informational stuff. I do put all of the memes on social media. Still do that. Um, you should have all of the memes already for OG, single life, diaries. So, um, these are just going to be informational only. So, here we go. Clayton admitted that he has a folder on his computer with multiple bilingual marriage therapists as he feels he and Annalie should strongly consider couples therapy if she shows up at the altar. <laughs> well, first of all, yes, maybe that's true, but I think he also needs individual therapy because he clearly has an issue of how to argue, how to you know process certain things that happen and that's an issue so yeah next both rob and sophie agreed to not have 
bachelor and bachelorette parties as they didn't want to welcome any more unnecessary drama into their life. Smart move. Smart, smart move. (laughs) But that's it for the 90 day tweets that I'm going to mention here on the pod. We're just going to hop right into the reason that we are here. 90 Day OG Season 10 Episode 17. You may now kiss the bride. So, Nikki and Justin Igor is first. Not a lot here, but let's just go through this. So, we see him blow drying his hair with this t-shirt on that he's wearing with her face on the back of it and for some fucking reason when he was doing this he's like crouching down a little bit and his butt cheeks are showing and i'm like why is he doing that but then i realized what he was doing was creating cleavage with his butt to make it look like it was her cleavage and i'm just like jesus fucking christ and she comes in and she's like oh my god and she's like laughing she's like where'd you get that where'd you get that and i'm like from you nikki he got he got it from you don't make me think that you didn't know about the shirt because of course you knew about the shirt come on um so she says that she's feeling positive about the relationship because you know why y'all you know why she's feeling positive because she's positively digmatized because they just had sex the night before after the engagement party and she says and i quote and i will be using this actually spoiler alert i have used it (laughs) since watching the episode it came in quite handy (laughs) it just happened organically i swear to god (laughs) but she says and i quote she's happy my coochie's happy his peepee's happy he's happy everyone's happy (laughs) yeah so anyway he says that he's feeling sad about her leaving they're going to be seeing his mom on the way to the airport so that she can say goodbye and they get there to his mom and you know all the hugs and all that and mom hopes that she felt good while here in moldova sometimes sometimes not but anyways won't get into it um mom does have a small gift for nikki and it's basically like this bag with jewelry in it so you know she's loving that but nikki kind of again we've seen her kind of make reference of this before in the past and i think this is really her saying the choir part out loud and really settling because of comments like this that she's about to make but she says it is a huge deal being accepted by a heterosexual man's family and friends and because of the fact that his family, his friends have accepted her, she's going to do everything in her power to make sure that this relationship works out. And I said, but why would you settle for something where you're not getting fully fulfilled by him? You sure you have sex after the engagement party? That's a normal thing to do, I would think, because you're all in the happiness and all of that, whatever. But if you have a need where you want to have sex every day or every other day or whatever the case may be, and he is not willing to give that to you, then why are you settling for that? Maybe you think you'll change, which we will talk about with somebody else. I f- Am I right with that? There was, there was something where I'm like, oh, honey. Oh, yes, it's in single life. So we'll talk about that in single life. But you cannot sit around waiting for someone to change when change is never going to fucking happen. This is not a John Mayer song. We are not waiting for the fucking world to change. I'm sorry, but just not. And it's, it's not reasonable, but that's what she's choosing to do. So they're leaving now to head to the airport. And she does say on the way to the airport, if you cheat on me, I will cut your dick off. And I said, yes, <laughs> 
We have all women have said that one time or another. If you cheat, it's off. It's it's gone. Like you don't need it anymore. It's fine. Uh, as they're on the way there, she does say to him, you know, we made love last night and I have a part of you. And this was fucking amazing. Uh, I was so good. He literally says, yeah, millions of parts of me. <laughs> He's not wrong, honestly. They're just women. They're just swimming in there. But yes. He tells her, I will miss your right hook. And that's that's I know he's joking, but my God. Um he thinks for all of he sorry, he he thinks Oh sorry, so he thanks her for all the sweet moments. I think that's what he said, what I what I wrote here. Which either way you put it, what sweet moments? There weren't many sweet moments. There was a lot of arguing and a lot of yelling. What sweet moments? Anyway, um, she's leaving and she tells him, um, don't cry. And I said, but wait, was he, was he crying? Because I sure as hell didn't see the tears, but whatever. He then says, and in, in a moment that it's hard when your woman is, you know, somewhere, you know, somewhere else, there's, there's somewhere else. And he if you notice, he points it up, like, to the sky, and I'm like, oh, she's in the sky? She's in the ceiling? What is she in? He, it's literally like that T.I. Justin Timberlake song where he's like, I put my hands to the north, and they go up. That's not north, but it's okay. It's fine. It's not north. Um, But he says that he can't picture his life without her. And she is his future. Not for long. Not for long. But that's it for Nikki and Justin Igor until next week. Let's move on to Rob and Sophie. Again, not like a lot, a lot, but a little more than we have with them. But they're at the gym. And she asks him, let me know if my boob pops out. And he's like, boob. Like a dog finding a squirrel anyway um they're just playing he's playing with her but now we have skipping past the gym now and he's taking her to the flower shop because she has to pick out flowers for the wedding and claire is going to be meeting her rob will not be coming because and he says if she's gonna be there you know, just to make sure everybody can be, you know, copacetic and, and not get mad and shit, I'm going to go home. <laughs> I don't know if that's necessarily the right decision to make, but I do understand the decision making behind it. So, Sophie gets there. Mom's there already waiting for her and she goes up to the clerk and saying, okay, this is, I'm here to get some flowers for my wedding. Okay, what's her color scheme? And she says pink and blue. Oh my God. Oh, Jesus Christ. <sighs> Pink and blue is a theme for um, a baby shower or a gender reveal or something like that. Pink and blue is not a color that goes fucking together in any other situation, especially a wedding. And I, I don't care which way I put it. If I try to picture like a blush with like a, a darker blue or like a darker pink with a lighter blue. It doesn't fucking work. Not for a fucking wedding. What the fuck is this? You should be doing white or like maybe a green, like a light green with, mm, that could go with like a pink, I would think. Like if you do like a blush, but even then, like a picture in my head doesn't quite go. But you, you go with beachy colors. And, I, and for me, a beachy color is like a lighter green. Not pink and blue together that's horrible color scheme anyway though um the clerk gets her um shows her like a, a bouquet of like pink uh, i don't know what kind of flowers they were i didn't quite catch that because i was uh, appalled by the the color of them to go with this theme but she shows her this pot pink bouquet and i'm like oh god no oh jesus fucking christ no 
because all I could think about is that isn't going with anything blue. This is, I, whose idea was the color scheme? Because whose ever idea was the color scheme needs to rethink life. Those two things will go together. They just, I'm sorry, they just don't. But anyways, let's get past the flower conversation and let's just shit on Rob. Because why not? This is it. I mean, I'm all for a shit fest on Rob. Don't get me wrong. But there's a time and there's a place. And now when you're getting flowers, even if they're fucking going to be god awful. But here we go. Then Claire goes in on, where's Rob? Why is he not here? Wait a minute, did he drop you off? Why didn't he come in? He could have just come in. This was the perfect opportunity for him to come in and, you know, say, hi, Claire, how are you? And I would have just been like, hi, Rob, you know, great. You know, why I'm, you know, she's like, I don't really care, though, that he didn't say hi, but it just kind of shows the kind of person that he is. And I said, Claire, you are really loving shitting on Rob to the point where I feel like this is a sport for you. Like, there's a time and there's a place to shit on Rob, but now isn't it? So she asks Sophie, like, have you guys been arguing? And she says, no, they haven't been, but it's probably because they all they've been doing is avoiding so that they can be happy prior to the wedding. And I said, that's not the way to go. Avoiding the situations isn't going to make it go away. If anything, it's just going to fester in there more and make you resentful both of you resentful that he needs any other reason to be resentful but anyway claire says like i do worry how things will be with them after they get married but she says that couples this is what sophie says the couples have issues no one's perfect And she feels that Claire is being kind of overbearing in this moment, which I do kind of agree. I do feel like she might be a little bit overbearing, not letting things go. But, I mean, what do you do? (laughs) So, next scene, we're two days away from getting married. And he is picking out some men thongs from the wedding night. You know, that banana hammock and all that nonsense. They're going to be actually headed to Santa Barbara with where they're getting married the next day so that they're already there. They don't have to rush to get out of Santa Barbara. They'll be, they'll be great to go. But here's the situation. Claire, for whatever reason, I don't fucking know, is not going to be staying in the hotel anymore. So she needs a place to stay. And guess what? The only place that she can go is Rob's place. The place where they only have one bedroom. The place where the kitchen is literally two feet away, if that, from the bed. The place where they don't have a fucking bathroom in the unit. A place where you get the run going here. What the fuck? Can't they pick her up from the hotel on the way to Santa Barbara? Why is this woman staying in that? There's no privacy in there either. Rob and Sophie are not fucking before they had to head to Rara. Because I wouldn't want to miss. No way. Like, there's just no fucking way in high hell. The, no. Like, there's just no privacy in this place. Um, With, hell, there's no privacy in this place for the two of them. Because sometimes you just want to be alone and fuck off. You know what I mean? But anyway, this is what's happening. Um, And he pulls out an air mattress for her. And I guess it's she's going to be sleeping beside the oven. <laughs> but I think he does move it out after. But when he's blowing like blowing it up, it's like literally beside the oven. Um, but she'll basically be in the kitchen area. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So anyway, she's here. And we kind of see her struggling to get her suitcases in the place. And she's like, it's not going to help me. I'm, a, I'm on my own. On my own. Oh, but yeah, she she can't figure it out. But so I was like, I'm coming, I'm coming. Rob isn't moving. But as soon as Claire walks in the place and Rob comes to say hi to her, she's like, so, you know, um, are we not going to be good? Like, is there going to be a problem? I know you don't really want me here. And he says, 
I I offered pretty much to have you here. Like I came over here and said, how do you like, what the fuck? I, I think in this case, and I hate to give him anything. Rob did nothing wrong in this moment. Claire just went in on him the second she walked in. Like she was ready. She said, Dukes are up. Like she was ready to go. And she says, you know, usually, you know, a, a host is more hospitable. Um, not just sitting on the bed. Like, maybe I need something. You want to ask me something? And I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. And that's when he says, like, I got up and I said hi to you. I got up and I gave you the air mattress. Like, I got up and I did something. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? I have no problems. You do clearly. So, like, what the fuck? Um, and he says, I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm just, I'm just not trying to do it. And she says, I don't um, need to be here. I can go to a hotel. So then why aren't you at the hotel? Like, I'm so confused. But anyways, he says, I would rather, sorry, she says, I would rather stick an epidural in my forehead than have to be here. And I'm just like, I mean, I don't have experience with an epidural needle, but I've heard the epidural needle is huge and I hate needles. So I can't even imagine having to do that. But she does, um, Sophie does say, listen, let's go outside. Let's cool down, calm down. She's just trying to diffuse the situation. She doesn't want people going in on each other. That's all she wants. And Claire just feels uncomfortable. And what I hated here was Claire asking Sophie, can me and you just go to a hotel? And I said, no. And luckily, Sophie said no, too. She said, I have to stay here with him. And but, and I don't think she meant it like, I have to. Like, no, she didn't mean it. But she's like, I have to stick by him. And that's the right thing to do. Claire, you cannot keep asking your fucking daughter to disrespect. Not even supposed to disrespect. That's the wrong word to use. But not think about Rob's needs. And constantly think about yours. While in the middle of all of that, she's not thinking about her own needs. She's thinking about what Rob needs or what you need. And no one's thinking about what Sophie needs. And I really think that Sophie in this moment would have just wanted to stay home with him prior to their wedding. So this is unfair of Claire to ask Sophie this. I'm starting to see a pattern here. And I love that she set a boundary and said, no, we're not leaving. And that's unfair. That is absolutely positively unfair of Claire to ask Sophie, can we just go to a hotel because you don't want to be there? That's unacceptable. But meanwhile, while Claire is talking shit and Sophie's trying to calm shit down, guess what Rob is doing, guys? I mean, this is the least he could do anyways, but, you know, still. Clearly, he's trying to show some sort of something. He's trying to reach out some sort of olive branch in Rob's way. And Rob is filling up the air mattress for her. And they can hear it from outside that he's doing it. So that's great. And he says, listen, I know that I need to step it up a bit more with Claire. So this is what I'm doing. Uh, I'm trying to do things better. And Claire says, maybe I did handle things badly. Sometimes when I feel uncomfortable, I get prickly. <laughs> and she goes back inside. Both her and Sophie go back inside and she sees that the bread, the bed's been done. He's made it. He's done like a turn down service, like the hotel. Like it's perf perfect for her. It's the least he could have done. And she's like, Oh, that's so sweet. Oh, you turned it down. That's so sweet. She's like, thank you. And before she goes to bed, both Sophie and Rob are back in their bed, just kind of cuddling. Claire's there. She's like, I want to take this in. Remember, be like this. Always be like this. Don't be an asshole, Rob. Don't be, don't be a dick. Just keep being like this. Love her. Love each other. This is perfect. Okay. I'm going to go now. Okay. Good night. Let me just fuck off from feet away and let me go to my air mattress that's beside the fucking oven. But anyway, that is it for Rob and Sophie. Now let's do Jasmine and Gino. 
I loved this. So, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's quite a bit actually. I wrote quite a bit here, but let's get into it. So, Gino and Dane, oh, sorry, Dane, not Dane. Dane is gone at the moment. Atalatella. I bet he's going to be able to tell all. I'm so excited. Okay. Dana. Gino and Dana are arriving at the venue with somebody else I didn't recognize. And Coco. Coco is with them. And Gino, meanwhile, is putting Coco in the stroller. But before we start, you know, going off into with into the, the sunlight or the sun or rise or whatever the fuck with Coco in the stroller, Gino just say, listen, I got two hats. I got a backup hat and then I got the hat. And he asked Dana, which hat do you like? Y'all, they look the fucking same. They look the same. I think one maybe was a little shorter than the other, but they looked the exact same, the same color, same everything. It was, per- it was the same hat. But Dana picks the left one or the right. I don't know. He picks one of them. So then anyway, they go and, you know, they're going to go into the venue. Coco's in the stroller. But Coco says, you know what? fuck this and jumps out of the stroller his form as dana says just impeccable impeccable form was great but anyways back at the house jasmine is getting ready she's getting her hair done her makeup done by this mua um that seems to be really close to them i'm not really close to her i'm not sure if they're friends or if they've met before probably met before definitely met before but you know she seems to be such a support for jasmine in this moment it's great then back at the venue remember when i said last august oh, two weeks ago um that hey, i have not seen uncle marco and i really miss him guess what guys dun, 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 dun. uncle marco he's back i love him so much don't ask me why i just do uncle marco's here and Uncle Marco is actually going to be walking Jasmine down the aisle. He offered to do this. And I'm like, this is so good. Um, Uncle Marco is happy now and he's excited for this. He's like, yeah, you know, I wasn't about it. This was a crazy idea of his. I didn't agree with any of this shit. But you know what? I met her and I actually really like her. And now I feel really good about it. So let's do this. Let's go get married. <laughs> So back of the house, her hair is done. I'm not sure if the makeup was done. I'm not sure. Because I feel like whatever makeup she had at the actual like wedding was very subtle and pretty. It wasn't like this the pink lipstick that I saw her wearing, but I'm not sure. I didn't notice when we actually moved on. But the hair is done though. And Jasmine says that she um doesn't you know, what, no, sorry, she doesn't know if Gino will cry, um, but if he doesn't, the Mua says, like, he should be crying, so Jasmine's like, okay, well, maybe I will stomp him in the foot with my heel, then he'll cry, but the Moo is like, okay, um, I was actually thinking that if he doesn't cry, you could just turn back around and try it again, that's that's i wasn't i wasn't thinking violence <laughs> but now she's going to call her, her sister zulen because zulen was supposed to be her maid of honor and unfortunately for obvious reasons that can happen um but she says she says she's you still are you still are my my maid of honor but zulen tells jasmine that she looks beautiful and jasmine starts crying and she says she misses her and Zulan says, I'm wearing red because that was what I was supposed to wear if I was going to be physically at your wedding anyways. That was the color. So she, you know, she's good to go. And she says, you are my maid of honor or bridesmaid. I can't remember exactly what terminology, but I'm going to say maid of honor. Um, and Zulan tells her, stop crying. Your eyes will be puffy. <laughs> um... Uncle Marco is now helping Gino get ready. But who gives a shit about that? Because let's go back to Jasmine. Jasmine's out at the venue. And Jasmine goes to get dressed. But when they get in there, she's with um, Dana's wife, Michelle. They get into the room and they can tell that the dress is not actually hanging up anymore. It's fallen down the the the, the, the dress carry-on cover-up. 
I don't know why the name of it's not coming to me, but anyways, it's in that. So when they open the thing, the dress is just in a ball at the bottom of it. And, but she's, she's like, Gino, Gino, Gino. Of course he let the thing stay hanging up, but whatever. Um, but she gets the dress on and she looks incredible. And then we see Gino is waiting at the altar for her and he is setting up a laptop because her family is going to be zoomed in. So we have both her sisters, Zulen and Liz, and then her mother. Her mother looks incredible. Anyway, then Uncle Marco is going to go see Jasmine and she really, she's asked, like, I really appreciate Uncle Marco walking me down the aisle. She said, I don't have a father figure. And I know to Gino, Uncle Marco is his father figure. And I would love for him to be that for me. Um, so she's very appreciative of, of, of Uncle Marco. Um, and she thanks him and he says, the honor is mine. I love this. Um, she says that he is the best. And she loves them. Anyway, we see Coco is ready to go in his cute little suit. He looks adorable. And I'm not sure if she actually knew whether or not her family would be zoomed in or not. Because she seemed kind of surprised by it. But as she's walking down the aisle or walking to... The, the part where they're going to be getting married and um, the section they're going to be getting married and she can see the laptop is there and she knows it's her family and I don't know, I just came across that she didn't know that that they were going to be zoomed in but anyway, she's happy to see that. She can feel their love for all the way from Panama so she's, you know, loving that. Um, And then, you know, she gets there and all's great and we're going to get into the vows a little bit because Certain things that he said I thought was so sweet. Certain things that she said I thought was so sweet and funny. So he's going to go read his vows. But y'all, he can't say shit. He needs his glasses. And he's like, okay, I'll find my glasses. He has them on pockets. And she's like, do you have them? <laughs> and then he goes to the next pocket and he's like, okay, there we go. I found them. Um, He tells her that he loves her in Spanish. But as he's like trying to get it out, he's... He's getting all choked up and he can't get it out, but he does say that he loves her. Um, then her vows. I thought her vows were absolutely beautiful. Um, or, you know, at least part of it anyway. So that, but the part that I wrote down, you know, spoke to me. She says that there are um, two important days in a person's life. Number one, the day they are born. And number two, the day that they discover why. And Gino, you are my why. Oh, that's so sweet. She will undoubtedly move um, across the world to the coldest place that I have ever known. Um, but I thought that was so sweet. Oh, then the rings are exchanged and they are now husband and wife. So, yeah, he, um, when he got excited and started jumping him down, I don't know if anyone noticed, he lost one of the petals on the flower. <laughs> um, but they go to her family and they're like, yay, we're married. And they tell her family, we will do a wedding in Panama someday we will be seeing them getting married in Panama <laughs> in about maybe a year or two from now. We will be seeing that happen. Then I'm here for it. Now it's the reception. He tells his family, I feel so loved, or she says to his family, sorry, that she feels so loved and accepted, and that is the best wedding gift she could have ever asked for. But we got, we got an announcement, they say. And that is, they are going to be trying for a baby. Not right now. Not right now. We're not in front of you guys. We're not going to scare you or anything. We don't. You don't need to see me pee on him or anything like that. But it's going to happen like later. <laughs> but they're going to try for a baby. So it's great. Um, but yeah, so now they are um, taking some wedding photos and 
She says, baby, by any chance, will you take off the hat? And he says, no. Mm-mm. No, no, mm-mm, abort, abort. I'm not taking the fucking hat off. She's like, please, please, will you take the hat off? And he's like, okay. So he takes the hat off. And I feel like the whole world had my reaction. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> it's happening. He took the hat off. Oh my God, he took the hat off. And I think if we remember, we started off, uh, what was it? Last season, B90, I think we started B90 off by him taking his hat off and we were ending off their season this time around with him taking the hat off by himself, not her saying, these are nudes, but she rips his hat off his head. And you know what? He looks perfectly fine with that hat on. I think all he needs to do is shave that patch of fucking hair in the back of his head off and he needs to tan his head and he's perfect. He actually, I think, looks better without a hat on. Personally. He just needs to do a few little touch-ups and it's fine. But that, that's basically it for Jasmine and Gino. Congratulations to the newlyweds who are, I think have been married for like a year now. But the newlyweds. Congratulations. It's great. But that is it for uh, Gino and Jasmine. We're going to take a little break here. And when we come back, we will hop into the rest of the episode. Have you ever wanted to guest on a podcast like this one that you're listening to right now? Well, you can. You can definitely do this by visiting a website called pod match where you can sign up and be available for all different types of podcasts that you can guest on or you can even search for a podcast and say i want to i want to guest on your podcast i think we'd be a good match so if you want to do this you can go to our unique link which is joinpodmatch.com forward slash reality and you can sign up and do exactly that and you can find us and you can guest on our podcast so again that unique link is www.joinpodmatch.com that's j-o-i-n-p-o-d-m-a-t-c-h dot com forward slash reality r-e-a-l-i-t-e-a and you can be a guest on our podcast and i'm back so let's finish this up we got clayton and annalee so we're seven and a half hours away from getting married. She says, you know, she's like, I can sometimes make decisions that I will regret later. So I'm not sure, like, you know, where she lands in that. But she ends up calling her mom, Dora, the explorer, Dora. I'm not making fun of her mom's name. I just think Dora the Explorer. Anyways, she tells her what is going on and how she's feeling. You know, tells her about the whole stripper situation. She's feeling like absolute shit. Her mom literally says, you know, you did nothing wrong. It's not your fault. But then she also says, in, um, after Annalise tells her that she feels like leaving, you know, talking to him again, her mom says, couples argue. And she says, you know, you'd be throwing away two years. Don't be sad. Let's move forward. And you know what? On the one hand, I understand what she's trying to say. She knows her daughter. We don't know her that well. Really and truly, we do not know her. And you know, maybe she has a knack of being quick and making decisions before really thinking things through. And that's why she's telling Annalie to just don't harp on this, even though Clayton harps on shit himself, but don't harp on shit. 
let's move on. But on the other hand, your daughter is telling you, I am not happy here. I have a man who can't seem to let shit go. And I really just want to come home because this motherfucker is getting mad because he thinks or doesn't think, I don't know, that I'm going to fuck a stripper. And you're telling your daughter, well, couples argue. It's fine. Yes, couples argue, but couples should be arguing in a healthy and constructive way, not in this way where it's not going anywhere. You're just going around and around and around in circles until you, one of you finally falls off and says, I can't do this shit anymore. So I, I don't know what she should do. I mean, personally, for me, if I know that my future husband-to-be is harping on a stripper and has a pattern of not letting shit go, I don't know if I want to marry that person either. I really don't. Anyway, um, she says, like, all she wants to do right now is just run away. And at the end of the day, it is still her decision. It doesn't matter what her mom says or what anyone else says. At the end of the day, it's her decision. Whether or not she goes through with marrying this fucking guy. So we're five and a half hours away. And he's texting Annalie, trying to figure out where she is and, you know, where her head's at. They're in the same home at this current time. But she's trying to figure out, like, what's going on in her head right now. Um, but they have not seen each other. Um, he says, you know, she just blew up out of nowhere. And I said, you gaslighting, manipulative son of a bitch. Are you fucking kidding me? She blew up out of nowhere. You freaking are harping on the fact thinking that she's going to fuck the stripper who is literally just trying to shake his dick for coins. This is a job for this guy. And you're harping on the fact that she had a stripper, or better yet, Brandy had a stripper at her bachelorette party. Fuck you. This fucking guy. Anyway, he's like, I want to feel optimistic, but I don't feel that. Um, and but he didn't leave her voice note where he's kind of like cheeky and all this shit. And then he says, I will uh, see you at the altar, okay? And gives her fucking guinea pig kisses. Sir, you better take them guinea pigs with you to the fucking church because she's about to fucking eat your guinea pigs. That's the best fucking revenge. If he ate her fucking guinea pigs, I'm not saying she should eat her fucking guinea pigs. They're very cute. But I'm just trying to say, this is a woman who likes to eat fucking guinea pigs because that's what they eat in Peru. They are a delicacy. So she might fucking eat your fucking guinea pigs. Take them guinea guinea pigs with you make sure or you know cause a mom needs to take the guinea pigs with her when she goes to the fucking church because she comes later she's gonna eat your fucking pigs <laughs> anyway my camera's ready to go unlike clayton anna lee we find out has not messaged him at all hasn't even opened the message hasn't opened her fucking door to even say hello nothing so they go to the venue it's actually very nice the venue and they do have a reserved seat for his brother jeremy i think spelt just j-e-r-e-m-y not like the jeremy we have in love is blind but nonetheless let's go back to this jeremy i do remember him telling us this but i um this kind of slipped my mind but jeremy was his older brother who died, I believe it was on a car accident, right? Is that what I wrote down? Um, five years ago. And they have a reserved seat for for him and memoriam. And I thought that was very sweet. And he gets very emotional here. He starts crying. I'm sure it's just the weight of the world right now on top of the fact that his brother is not here. They're just completely just weighing on him. But then he decides to check his phone. And he sees that he's received a text not from Annalie, but from her mama, Dora Dora the Explorer. And she basically says, here, swipe or no swiping. I mean, she doesn't want to fucking marry you. <laughs> Actually, what she does say is that um, Annalie called me. And she told me about 
you maybe don't want to marry her, which is actually not what Annalise said. But nonetheless, she's like, get your fucking shit together. Okay, shut up about the fucking stripper who again was just shaking his stick for money. Let's get over with it and let's get fucking married, you piece of guinea pig shit. I don't know. This is what came to my head. But yeah, he he's like, oh, all right then. And yeah, we're about four hours away now from the wedding. And still nothing else is happening. Three hours away. She's not getting ready whatsoever like not even an ounce like i'm thinking this is about the time where you should be getting makeup done hair done dress on getting there that could take about three hours or so what's happening here but nothing's happening we're now at an hour before the wedding and we're back at the venue now he still hasn't heard a fucking peep from her but as cameron has said oh, that's worse than her not responding she has opened the message but has not replied. That is worse. That is definitely worse. And we got a situation. She's not answering. But Clayton says, worst case scenario, what do I do? If I'm out there in front of all these people who I love and she doesn't show up, I get jilted at the fucking altar. What do I do? And <laughs> Cameron says, you cry? I mean, what else do you do? 30 minutes away. Mom is now here with his shoes because y'all, he forgot his fucking shoes. This man is a child. So she comes with the shoes and she wants to believe that he is getting married, but you know what? He might not because Annalie is not here (laughs) and may not show up. It's now 530. It's the time of the wedding. The wedding is supposed to start now at 530. People are filing in. People are sitting down. And still fucking nothing. So, you know, we have the groomsmen. Well, he's coming in now. Groomsmen are coming in. And I'm thinking, oh, wait, Cameron was fully ready. That is him ready. No suit jacket. No nothing. Just Clayton wearing the suit jacket. What the fuck? I cannot stand a man who is wearing suit pants with the shirt tucked in, but no fucking suit jacket. What the fuck? fox idea whose idea was this oh i know clayton's let's move on so um 23 minutes um late nothing 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 from her it's 23 minutes late and brandy's like um excuse me sorry clayton um we it's 23 minutes past the time that you were supposed to be married um we have guests here you know what do we do and he's like i'm aware i'm aware yep yeah, i'm freaking out right now I'm, I'm fucking freaking out i know i know i know i'm gonna text her again because you know brandy's like okay have you have you heard her or anything and he's like no mm-mm, no she's read my message but she didn't she didn't she didn't respond um <laughs> now we Fast forward seven whole fucking minutes to 30 minutes late and still nothing. And he's like, you know what? We It's six o'clock now. Uh, I should have been a husband by now, but uh, she's not here. So um, I think we should start talking to guests and, and start telling them that um, I'm probably being jilted at the altar at the moment. And my who was supposed to be my wife is probably on a plane to Peru. <laughs> But that's it for um, Clayton and Annalie. All right, last but not least, we've got Citra and Sam. So they're heading back to the Airbnb, and she's really hungry now. But we got two hours until the American wedding. Then when they get there, you know, he's kind of, telling her men, you know, this is what's going to happen. And when the priest marries us, blah, blah, blah. Um, but Herman's like, wait a minute. Priest? Did he say priest? Did the priest marry you guys? Well, yes. It's actually a pastor. But that's all they could get, apparently. And Herman is not about it. 
He says, we are not Christian. We are Muslim. We should not be having a pastor marry them. It said, you know, no. And he says, like, what about the imam? And they did ask the imam if he would do it. But unfortunately, he had a prior engagement, so he couldn't do it. And Herman said, the only thing that I will allow you guys to be married over is the Quran, not the Bible. So, yeah. Sam didn't think that the pastor marrying now Muslims would be a problem. And I'm thinking, how did you not think that that could be a problem? I wouldn't, as a person who identifies as, you know, Christian, whatever sense that is, you know, I don't really go to church or anything like that. But as a person who identifies as a Christian, technically was baptized in a Catholic church, I'm not going to go to a rabbi or an imam to marry me. I'm going to either go to a, well, I'm not going to go to a priest. I'm not going to marry in a Catholic church. Fuck that shit. I'm either going to go to a pastor or I'm going to go to just a general officiant who can do a non-denominational wedding. Even if you are religious or you do, you know, whatever, like, honestly, personally, for me, that is what I did in my wedding. We had a non-denominational wedding. We had little sprinkles of religion because at the end of the day, we, we do believe in a higher power, but, you know, he was Seventh-day Adventist. I'm, as I said, Christian. So, we just kept it simple. You know, that's, that's my preference. But he could have just gotten a simple officiant to just do a non-denominational wedding or like whatever, you know? I just, I'm just, <laughs> not, not, not a lot of planning. Anyway, we see him calling around to find someone who can officiate their wedding. And she, uh, Citra, hopes that Sam can fix this because otherwise they can't get married. So we find out here, though, Nicole fraud and all this whole thing. We do find out that his brother, Luke, who I don't think we've met before, actually has been ordained. And he, I guess he didn't know that himself. I think the other brother told him Luke could do it. He's ordained. He's like, oh, is he? Huh. So he goes out and he asks Luke if he would officiate their wedding. And we do find out that he had been ordained three years back, did it for the fun of it, didn't think he'd ever use it, but here he is, ready to use it. And I'm like, come on. This is too damn convenient. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Sam goes out to ask him, and he says, sure, I'll do it. Great. So, that's at least taken care of, but he is going to have to kind of just run it by Herman, which he does. We'll get there in a minute. But not only that, he has another thing he has to do, and that is fire the priest, pastor. And the pastor does show up, and Sam's like, hmm, yeah, see, pastor, okay, yeah. We've got a little bit of a situation. Thank you so much for coming and everything. Really appreciate it. God bless you. But, um, hmm, we're Muslim. I just recently became Muslim, like, a couple hours ago. And I didn't really think it through that because we're Muslim, or as he says, what does he say? Muslim, Muslim. He's, he says so wrong. Anyway, he's like, because we're Muslim, I'm gonna have to pass on the Jesus Christ type of wedding. Um, you can't marry us. Thank you so much though for coming out. Sorry that's inconvenienced you. I should offer you some money, but I'm so broke that I don't even do that. So thank you so much. And like I said, God bless you. Or Allah. Because you know that's what he would say. He'd be like, I mean Allah. Allah bless you. But this basically the man just fires him on spot, offers him no money, nothing. And I was like, 
wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. And he took it well. He's like, oh, I'm not needed. Also, your, your brother's doing it. That's great. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to go now. You know, nothing. Okay. I'm going to go now. And those guys walking outside saying, these fucking fools. Anyway. At least now that's over. And Sam is like, well, now I'm going to have to go to Herman and tell Herman that this is what I have come up with and pray and hope to God that he doesn't have an issue because Luke is not Muslim and, uh, you know, he, he is, I think he's a Catholic. So he tells Herman, this is what we're doing. This is how it's going to go. My brother has offered to do this and is that going to be a problem because he is, he's not Muslim. He is Catholic, Christian, whatever. Is that going to be an issue? And he says, no, it's great. Your father, your brother is willing to do this. It's so brave of him. So problem solved. Just like that. Just like that. It was, it was too easy. Like, honestly. I bet this was always how it was going to go. Anyway, we do find out here that the sisters speak English. So we've been doing this the whole time and we didn't know the sisters spoke English. Okay. Wow. We do kind of, because I wondered this, because I wasn't too sure, but we do get the answer to whether or not her mother is alive, and the answer is no, she did pass away. We don't find out why, but she did pass away, and, you know, Citra telling this, she's getting really choked up, and it's really difficult for her to talk about her mom, but she says, you know, she was amazing. She would, you know, she says after her mom passed away was when her and her dad got close. So, um, so she's actually surprised that Luke is going to be marrying them, but she's like, it's just like friends when Chandler, sorry, when Joey married Chandler. And I'm like, okay, I know she means when Joey married Chandler and Monica or ordained their wedding, but the way she put it, it's like, oh, so wait, Joey married Chandler? I didn't see that episode. I didn't, I didn't see that. <laughs> but anyways, we know what she means. But yes, that's, she's comparing it to friends and that's fine. I love friends. Pivot. So, well, but let's, um, do this basically. Luke is not taking off his hat, which would be appropriate, but hey. Um, Sam tells her she looks beautiful, and but he does also say that I can't wait until tonight, and I'm like, my god, dude, you have got her for just a second, you're getting married. But he says, wait a minute, though, before we hop into this wedding thing, let me, uh, let me get down on one knee, give you this ring that I wasn't able to give you before, and ask you, will you marry me? Where I said she responds with, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> like, we're doing this right now, we're getting married now. Like, I thought that was a great response. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're now, it's very simple, you know, kind of situation here, and they're married, and their kiss was very simple, which she said it was great. Um, and Dee Dee, his mom, says to him, I'm happy that I came. Yes, I had doubts about whether or not to come to the thing earlier, but I mean, the only reason I wasn't there is because your grandmother got sick. And I said, the Lord don't like liars. The Lord does not like liars. And why are you always lying? Like, don't lie. Friend of God, our Savior. Anyway, so that's what she wants us to believe. She wants us to believe that they actually, she was actually going to be there. But anyways, but now they're going to go uh, do their thing, do what married couples do, and they're going to, they're going to go fuck. 
But that's basically it with Sam and Citra for this week. We do see them again next week, but let's get into next time on. We do see Ashley and Manuel. Ashley's freaking out. She's ugly crying because we're driving right into the hurricane. Her family's over her. That's that. Sam and Citra definitely did the deed, but now he has to go to court because who knows how this shit's going to turn out. Rob and Sophie are getting married, or are they? Because my girl walks off when she's supposed to be walking towards him. She's walking in, I guess, the opposite direction. I would too. Justin Igor, it looks like he breaks up with Nikki. And uh, is Annalie going to marry today or is she, uh, is she leaving on that midnight plane to Peru? Who knows? But that is the end of 90 Day Fiance for this week. So if you like what you heard, please share us with everyone in your life. Please also rate and review that helps our growth which you can do on either Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And we're on every one of your favorite podcast apps. So make sure you hit follow, subscribe on your favorite app so you don't miss a single episode. You can connect with us by going to either Facebook or Instagram at Reality Times 2. You can also go to Twitter, TikTok, Reddit at Reality Times 2 Pod. And you can email us by going to reality times two on outmail.com. Don't forget we have our website, which is at solo.to forward slash reality times two. And also, don't forget I have my other podcast with my friend Mikkel called The Next Take Podcast, where we talk about, well, just about everything over there. We're on every one of your favorite podcast apps over there as well. But you can get access to any links, any socials, anything like that by going to our website, which is solo.to forward slash next take podcast. Um, and you also can go to YouTube, which is next take podcast as well. But of course, all of these links will be in the show notes. But that is it for now, guys. Bye.